Saturday, February 20th, 2021, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So today we're going to look at a central banker who admitted that our current monetary system is a Ponzi scheme. Before I start, though, I'd like to say that, uh, yes, the markets are looking very interesting, especially the bond market, the U.S. Treasury uh, market. Yields continue to rise yesterday. The 10-year yield broke through uh, definitively, it, it looks like, through 130. Uh, I think the 30-year went up to 215. The shorter-term yields are not moving, so the curve is continuing to steepen. We saw uh, gold and silver recover very well from uh, drubbings <laughs> or smashes o overnight uh, from Thursday to Friday. So, yes, we're going to talk about this uh, uh, tomorrow on Sunday uh, on my weekly live stream, Sunday live stream. Uh, I'll answer any questions you want about the markets. But I think it's important to look at the monetary system because I'm getting a lot of new subscribers, new viewers, and sometimes I get questions that um, basically show shows me uh, that uh, a lot of people still uh, need to understand why gold and silver are so important, why our monetary system is not fit for purpose and hasn't been basically uh, for probably about a century, but uh, really <laughs> completely not for purpose uh, for the world since August 1971. And uh, yes, Billy is back. Billy does move. But he, he loves that sofa. When he gets up on that sofa, he just falls asleep. And yes, he does snore. I can't help that. But uh, yeah, so we're going to look uh, at a central banker. I think he passed away about 10, 10 years ago, maybe a little less. I'm not too sure, or maybe more. He was still alive in the early 2000s. Before I go through what he said back in uh, the early 70s, we'll go through his uh, background. So this is what the uh, American Institute for Economic Research, which is where he gave this uh, presentation to. Uh, this is what they say uh, about uh, this uh, central banker. So it says, to all friends, of American Institute for Economic Research. We are pleased to inform all friends and supporters of the Institute that Mr. John Exter, author of the preceding article, has been awarded and has accepted a three-year appointment as Senior research, research Fellow at the Institute. So here's his background. Mr. Exter retired this past spring from his position as Senior Vice President of First National City Bank, New York. Well, that's uh, the old uh, bank that was merged with Citibank. It's part of Citigroup today. Uh, it's part of the Rockefeller uh, banking, really uh, conglomerate, I would say. Prior to joining First National City Bank in 1959, he had served as governor of the Central Bank of Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka today, and as vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, as well as economist for the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and chief of the Middle East Division of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, World Bank. Throughout his long and distinguished career as a banker and economist, he has been widely known as a leading student of developments in the international monetary field. In the major capitals of the world, especially in the leading central banks, his views are sought and respected. Unlike many economists, he also has a marked ability to present his views in language readily understandable by laymen. The preceding article is an excellent example of this unusual ability. At the Institute, Mr. Exter will study the latest developments in modern procedures of scientific inquiry and continue his research on domestic and international monetary problems. His findings, as published from time to time, will be of unusual interest during the difficult and uncertain times that lie ahead. 
So that's John Exter. So let's go uh, to the uh, article. It was written in June 1972. So almost a year after uh, uh, Richard Nixon, President Nixon, uh, closed the gold window, he suspended, of course, the convertibility of the dollar into gold temporarily, as he said, on August 15th, 1971. That was a Sunday, of course. So the American Institute for Economic Research, uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, so June 1972. So the title of the article is Currencies Today Are IOU Nothings. So <laughs> nothing's changed. Now that the international monetary system we have so long known has broken down and the world is groping through monetary form for a new one, it is time to consider some fundamentals. What is money anyway? So here we go. First, it is a means of payment or medium of exchange. I prefer the first phrase it is simpler. We all use money to pay our bills, to buy goods and services. We all accept money when we sell. Second, it is a standard of value. We quote values of goods and services in terms of it. The resulting ratios are prices. Third, it is a store of value. We hope to avoid loss by holding it. Money holds its value if it is scarce and remains scarce. Scarcity is the keystone of store of value money. Today, no money in the world fully performs all three services. National currencies are being used as means of payment and standard of value money, but none in this inflationary age is a, an assured store of value money. In fact, a foremost concern of voters and politicians everywhere is that so many currencies are so rapidly losing their value in terms of commodities and services. Commodities like gold and silver, which are being used as store of value money, are not being used as either means of payment or standard of value money. Thus, the world we have so long known in which most currencies were redeemable at a fixed price in store of value money like gold is in disarray. People are confused and wondering what money they can trust. Sensing the instability of the system as a whole, they turn day by day from one means of payment money to another in the foreign exchange markets and much more gradually to store of value money like gold in the London and Zurich gold markets scarce commodity. If we carefully look into the meaning of this market churning, it becomes clear that store value money, if it is to endure, must be a commodity and a scarce commodity too. Silver has long been a less satisfactory store of value money than gold, principally because it has been and promises to continue to be more abundant. Many of the currencies uh, used as means of payment and standard of value money have not proved good store of value money chiefly because they too have grown too abundant since they are simply either paper, paper currency notes or bookkeeping deposits promised to pay, i.e. debt obligations or IOUs. The confidence of people in them as store of value money depends heavily upon the ability of the central banks responsible for their issuance to honor those promises to pay in the commodity that is indeed store value money. This is the issue of convertibility, which the Europeans, especially the French, are emphasizing today. In that part there, John Exter clearly uh, shows how the law of supply and demand is very simple and how it affects the value of the money. Until March 1968, when the two-tier gold system was established, uh, the central banks issuing all major currencies were promising all holders, I owe you gold at $35 an ounce. 
under the two-tier system. However, the IOU gold promise was abrogated for private people and except for the South African Reserve Bank, central banks refused to sell any gold at any price to private people. The IOU gold at $35 an ounce promise was honored only among central banks and governments. And even among them, it became gradually more tenuous. On August 15, 1971, the IOU gold promise was abrogated even among central banks. I, I think that's the most important date uh, in monetary history, really, probably forever, August 15th, 1971. And we happen to be in the completion of the 50th year of having really a non-monetary system. So we'll continue now. He talks about same relative rates. So here we go. So today, all currencies in the world are saying, I do not owe anybody anything. So there you go. That's a Ponzi scheme, in my opinion, in my view. And that's a central bank banker saying it, not me. Each one says, in effect, I owe you nothing in the way of any commodity that is a store of value money. In that situation, an attempt was made at the Smithsonian to reestablish fixed exchange rates, which meant making one central bank's I owe you nothing equal to a certain number of another central bank's I owe you nothings, uh, with a two and a quarter percent spread on either side of parity. It is obvious that such an arrangement could last only if the exchange rates agreed on at the time were equilibrium rates. And if in future all central banks agreed to control the issue of their new IOU nothings at the same relative rates. The second condition was certainly not met and no one can be sure the first one was. Although it was agreed to raise the price of store value money gold to $38 an ounce, no arrangements made for a central bank that went into deficit because it issued too many IOU nothings to pay a surplus central bank in gold at that fixed price. Meanwhile, the gold owned by central banks remains for the most part buried inactive in their vaults. Gresham's law has worked. Bad money has driven uh, good out of circulation. Even among central banks, all currencies are inconvertible into gold. We are in a world of irredeemable paper money. Further conclusions follow from this analysis. Good store of value money is clearly the strongest kind of money. I owe you nothing money, which people may continue to hold as a store of value money for a long time, but only with the enticement of even higher rates of interest may continue also for a long time to serve as a means of payment and standard of value. So yes, the current system is working well as a means of uh, payment and standard of value, but there, it's definitely not working as a store value uh, money. And uh, even though we're told that there's no inflation, that's just an excuse to keep issuing more and more of this I owe you nothing. Um, yeah, and, and they can't even keep rates higher to attract more people to hold the store value money. And it doesn't look like they're going to do that anytime soon, right? So let's continue. But as it becomes more abundant, it will serve these functions less and less satisfactorily, if too abundant, not at all. It would then also cease being held as store of value, not worth a continental. History is full of examples of IOU nothing currencies that have disappeared. Some currencies will, of course, become overabundant faster than others. Uh, over time, it is scarce store value money like gold that endures. If enduring store value money must be a commodity, it follows that governments and central banks cannot create it. 
unless they were to go, let's say, into the gold mining business. Uh, it follows also that if they persist in creating I owe you nothing money, they will slowly but surely run themselves out of the money making business altogether and have to start over again. So I think we're pretty much near the period or the time where this could happen. Uh, <laughs> I think the debt load, the amount of money uh, or I owe you nothings out there are, are so exorbitant. I, I can't see a better time for it to happen, especially with what uh, is going on socially, economically, uh, politically. If it doesn't happen soon, I'll be very surprised. So he goes here into Gresham's Law. Governments will always try to short up I owe you nothing money with laws making it legal tender or even laws prohibiting the holding of store of value money like gold. But such laws cannot for very long add value to something that is losing value in the marketplace. So he's trying to say here, yes, they will try to do everything to make their I owe you nothing money look good, but eventually the market wins. So for all of you uh, out there who think they can keep manipulating um, their I owe you nothing uh, money uh, through really the futures market, through keeping the paper price of gold and silver down, you need to think again. Gresham's law, which is really a special form of the law of supply and demand, will override man-made laws. In fact, there would be no Gresham's law if governments did not persistently try by man-made laws to overvalue their I owe you nothing money in terms of store of value money. Thus, laws prohibiting people from holding store of value money like gold cannot succeed, for gold as a commodity can be held in countless forms and readily converted from one form to another. People will hold jewelry old, or old coins or what have you, and people whose government permit them to hold gold will do so in any form. It should also be apparent that monetary theorists cannot arbitrarily decide what money is. Theories that are based on an arbitrary definition of the stock of money, particularly I owe you nothing money, will slowly lose their relevance. Such theories try to overvalue I owe you nothing money, just as governments do. And in the marketplace, Gresham's Law will override man-made theories, just as it overrides man-made laws. So it also follows that governments cannot reduce the importance of a store of value money like gold in the monetary system, much less demonetize it. So yes, people might want to say gold is finished, uh, this and that and that, but people will always uh, hold on to gold because people know deep down that gold and silver uh, are store value money. A monetary authority monetizes anything by buying it and taking it into its balance sheet as an asset and paying for it by creating or issuing monetary liabilities, I owe you nothings, which are accepted by the seller. It demonetizes anything by selling it from its assets and extinguishing an equivalent amount of its liabilities tendered to it by the buyer. So here we go, uh, the inflationary part, obviously inflationary. To demonetize gold, the central banks of the world would have to sell all of their holdings in the open market. If they were to try, the exercise would be very deflationary. So that's why they need gold. That's why the central banks need gold. And uh, yes, <laughs> they, they try to sell it, back in the late 90s, but they quickly re reversed that and they came up with an agreement to stop selling it because they knew it would be deflationary. For they would be extinguishing their monetary liabilities with every sale. To avoid the risk 
of deflation in today's monetary world, they would simultaneously have to monetize IOU nothings like government securities by creating new IOU nothings of their own more rapidly than they extinguish the old by demonetizing gold. Such an exercise would obviously be inflationary and central bank IOU nothings would steadily lose value in the marketplace. Well, that's what they're doing with QE, uh, this uh, monetization, uh, buying IOU nothings with more IOU nothings, which is crazy, really. Such an exercise would obviously be inflationary and central bank IOE nothings would steadily lose value in the marketplace. Under Gresham's law, the bad IOU nothing money would drive the good gold store of value money out of circulation. So here's a very important point he makes and I think uh, we're very near this juncture here that he talks about and he says, but if the central banks persisted and there would be precious few restraints to stop them, their IOU nothings would slowly lose value and under runaway conditions, all value in the marketplace. Thus, over time, the marketplace would frustrate central banks if they tried altogether to demonetize gold. It would demonetize their IOU nothing money uh, instead. So they're likely not to try. So yes, uh, that, that's why they can't keep manipulating the price of gold too far down because it's going to create even more problems for them. Uh, I think what they're trying to do is to keep people from protecting themselves, right? In recent years, there has been an attempt to substitute so-called paper gold or special drawing rights, SDRs, in the International Monetary Fund for real gold. So this is a really good part here because there's a lot of people out there who think uh, that uh, the uh, powers that be are going to replace the petrodollar with the SDRs, but the SDRs are even worse <laughs> than the petrodollar. So this is from a guy who worked for the World Bank, worked for the Fed. He's saying it, not me. One high IMF official is even reported to have called gold metallic SDRs. <laughs> if used seriously, such an appellation flies in the face of marketplace assessment of store value money. The SDR has no obliger, no promise to pay any store value money at a fixed price, nor fixed maturity dates, other than a complicated reconstitution provision. It cannot be sold at will only by central banks in deficit, only to central banks strong enough to be designated by the IMF to receive them. So it is, uh, who owes you nothing <laughs> and when, and it does not even pay a market rate of interest, only one and a half percent. If central banks ever monetize them in significant amounts, they will have moved from days when they issued their IOUs principally to buy enduring store of value money like gold to these days when they issue their IOU nothings principally to buy government IOU nothings to the day when they would issue their IOU nothings to buy who owes you nothings. <laughs> so that's the SDR. So they might try the SDR, but you can forget about it working. In days to come, international monetary reformers will have to consider whether these new kinds of money will produce a stable monetary world. In the world's marketplaces, will they hold their value against goods and services in general? <laughs> They're definitely, definitely not doing that these days, the fiat currencies. More particularly, will those issued by different central banks hold their value against one another? Most particularly, will any of them hold their value against store value money like gold? I think not, <laughs> uh, nor silver. So there you go. Uh, hopefully uh, this has helped you um, understand more why our monetary system is in so much trouble with all the uh, money printing, all the, the QE that we've had 
not only in the last 12 months, but since the great crisis of 2008, great financial crisis. So, and um, yes, hopefully it, it will make you understand why gold and silver are so important and why you have to hold on to your gold and silver if you have any, or why you should try, in my opinion, to do some kind of dollar cost averaging uh, stacking of gold and silver. You don't have to uh, overdo it. You don't want to like uh, be uh, obliged to, to sell it if you have an emergency. Just So just think of it, uh, of it as savings. So yes, I, I think we're very near the end of this uh, non-system. I think John Exter also called this IOU nothing uh, system a non-system because there's no store of value money in the system. So there you go. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button. Please share it far and wide. Think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and all these other platforms below here. I wish you all a great weekend. Take care. Bye.